Information, please. Wake up, America. Time to stump the expert. It's time for you, the much quizzed public, to turn the tables and grill the authorities. Match your brains with those of our board of experts. How do you do it? Well, here's how. Send us questions with the correct answers on subjects of general interest. And make a special note of this. Beginning tonight, Information Please is increasing the reward. For each question accepted, we pay $5. For each question not correctly answered, we pay $10. That's a possible high of $15 in all, plus the pleasure of embarrassing Franklin P. Adams, John Kieran, or some other big brain. But I'll let Clifton Fadiman, literary editor of the New Yorker magazine, who acts as our master of ceremonies, tell you about the expert, Mr. Fadiman. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. We present tonight a quartet of bright-eyed savants. Uh, first, John Kieran, whose range of information reaches from the football field to the stars, with way stops among the birds, the bees, and the flowers. Secondly, Franklin P. Adams, columnist of the New York Post, and a man who can spot a question and a quotation coming at him a mile away. I want to stop the program, as a matter of fact, and present Mr. Adams with a surprise of his life. He doesn't know it, but this is his birthday tonight. And I'm going to ask the other experts to greet him in proper fashion. One happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, Frank Adams. Happy birthday to you. you. Now, Mr. Oscar Levant has no birthday song coming to him. He's a composer and pianist who is gradually picking up quite an education for himself on these programs. And our guest of honor this evening is John Gunther, internationally famous foreign correspondent, author of Inside Europe and of a forthcoming book, Inside Asia. Now, ladies and gentlemen, the rules are simple. If these experts know the answer, they will have to raise their hands, just as in school. You remember school. If the answer is incorrect, the cash register will ring up $5. And that five dollars will be sent to the lucky questioner. And now, gentlemen, uh, we will uh, start off with a question for which you should know the answer. Mr. Adams, suppose I give you this question. What is different about our program tonight? Uh, we have a sponsor. Very good. Correct. Canada Dry. Canada Dry is correct. From now on, we are sponsored by Canada Dry. And now for the real stickers, that was too easy. <coughs> the first question comes from Mr. H. Russell of Chicago. I'm going to ask you, gentlemen, to give five typical remarks made by the guests or hosts after the guest's departure. You know, guests come and they go. Sometimes it's the second part that's the nicest thing about them. Uh, what do you say after they've left? Or what do they say after they've left? Mr. Gunther. <coughs> Any idea? That fellow certainly liked scotch. Yes, that's a very good one. That's one. Thank you, Mr. Gunther. Uh, Mr. Levant. I'll never have that Oscar Levant here again. <laughs> Very good, Mr. Levant. <laughs> Mr. Curran. I thought they'd never go home. Yes, I think that's the most popular of all. That's three. <clears throat> Two more. Mr. When Mr. do we Curran. have another party? I beg pardon, Mr. Gunther? When do we have another party? That's a nice sweet one. I'm very glad to get someone to give us a good-natured cliché. Uh, Mr. Curran. Where do you suppose she ever got that dress? <laughs> <laughs> very good. <laughs> the one that uh, we use most frequently at my house is... Didn't we give them veal the last three times? <laughs> Very good. Second question. From Jonathan Goldberg of New York City. Now, gentlemen, I ask you to look out for the concealed puns in this question. Now, you're all punsters of old standing, particularly Mr. Adams. Watch out. Identify from the following poems the famous persons indicated. Now, there are three poems. I'll read them one at a time. One. Way up in the north, where the climate is shivery, he burst into fame. By a special delivery. Who is it, gentlemen? Who is it? Way up in the north, where the climate is shivery, he burst into fame by a special delivery. Is it a poet? Uh, the answer is the name of a poet? No, no, no. Just a famous person. Does, Does it have to be a writer? No, not at all. Where'd you get this idea? It'll be an aviator. Uh, Mr. Curran. Uh, Dr. Dafoe. Dr. Dafoe is perfectly correct. <laughs> He burst into fame by a special delivery. Now, the next one, uh, in the next one, the meter is simply terrible, but the sentiment is very clear. She's here, she's there, she's everywhere. The nation's friend and pal. No one in history ever got so many miles to a gal. 
Mr. Levant. Mrs. Roosevelt. Very good. Thanks. <laughs> now, the third is the hardest of all. Listen closely. When young, he played a minor part, and thus he got his early start. Today, the air grows tense and heated when he says, gentlemen, be seated. Oh, this is a clever one. Makes me curl up with enthusiasm. Mr. Levant. I want to hear it again. Ah, oh, you love it, eh? All right. Here it goes. Now, watch the concealed pun. When young, he played a minor part, and thus he got his early start. Today, the air grows tense and heated when he says, gentlemen, be seated. Could it be John Lewis? That's correct, Mr. Gunther. Thank you very much indeed. I think that's pretty good. The minor part, of course, is a pun, and when he says, gentlemen, be seated, refers, of course, to sit-down strike. Very good. The third question from W. Houghton of Newborough, Ontario. This is a Shakespeare question. Mr. Adams, are you in on this? All right. Answer the following questions with appropriate quotations from <coughs> Shakespeare. You have to get three out of four. This isn't so easy. What would you say about Niagara Falls when you got back to the home folks? Quotations from Shakespeare. What a fall was there, my country. Very good, Mr. Adams. Thank you very much indeed. From Julius Caesar, of course. Two. What would you say to a father searching for his newborn baby in a hospital? What would you say to a father? Mr. Adams, got that one? It's a wise son that knows his own father. Uh, you got the generations mixed. The wise think. father that knows his own yes, child. Yes, that's very good. <laughs> <laughs> but I think your intent was correct. I'm going to mark you 100% on that. Three, what does a head chef say to his assistants who are about to peel onions? What does a head chef say to his assistants who are about to peel onions? If you have tears, prepare to shed them now. Very good, Mr. Gunther. That's right. <laughs> also from Julia Steve. And the last one is the hardest of all. Aren't these clever, Mr. I Chair? don't like that one. I like, oh, your offense is rank. It smells to heaven. That's <laughs> very good. <laughs> Four, a corset maker. A corset maker is asked by the fat woman of the circus how long it would take him... To make her corset. I know slips on this one. All right, Mr. Kerry. <laughs> From Midsummer Night's Dream. Puck, I'll put a girdle around the earth in 60 minutes. 40, 40. 40. Yep. <laughs> very good, Mr. Chair. Four out of four. That's very good. <laughs> the boys are pretty good tonight. The next one, for Mrs. Dawn A. Follinsby of Palo Alto, California. Now, this is a musical question. Uh, we'll, the question is this. You're asked to play the folk tune, The Farmer in the Dell as it might have been written by each of the following composers. There are four of them, Liszt, Chopin, Gershwin, and Ravel. And in order to determine whether the answers are correct, I'm going to ask this very intelligent studio audience to indicate by applause if they think uh, that the answer is more or less correct. I don't know who's going to do this. Mr. Kieran plays the piano. Mr. Levant, would you like to try it? The Farmer in the Dell, as played by, in the first place, Liszt. It's a tough question. Now, I may as well warn the audience that the studio uh, audience consists entirely of friends of Mr. Levant and a paid clack. Just to make everything perfectly honest. All right, Mr. Levant. Do the farm in the dell for me. I should do it? The farmer in the dell, the farmer in the dell. I hold the cherry, oh, the farmer in the dell. That's pretty good the way it is. <laughs> they want to stop <laughs> now, we're going to have it as list would do it. List. All right, this is list. List is, uh... Listen to list. Which is the second one? Uh, Chopin. I'd rather do Chopin. You want to come back First. to this? Yeah. All right, I'll take uh, take him off the list and put Chopin. Okay. No, I'll do a list later. All right, list later. Chopin first. Is that it, the farmer in the dell? All right. Very good, Mr. Levant. Sounds all right to me. Now, the next one would be George Gershwin. No, George Gershwin. Farmer in the dell as played by George Gershwin. No, no, you can't take that away. Well, 
like that, let us know. All right. Uh, the third one, The Farmer in the Dell, as conceived by Ravel. Gee, a poem. Yeah. Ravel. Now, do you want to come back to this? Yeah. All right, let's have this. Farm in the Dell. <laughs> like this so much, there's nothing to stop you from uh, giving us the farmer in the Dell as Levant would do it. <laughs> Have you a style, Levant? The farmer in the Dell, oh, the farmer in the Dell. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Five very good uh, impromptu compositions, possibly having something to do with the farmer in the Dell, possibly not. <laughs> I hope Mr. Dornay Follinsby is as satisfied as the studio audience seems to be. The next one from uh, Mary Hill of Miami, Florida. What news event does each of the following figures bring to mind? I have to get four out of five. One, 19 to zero. 19 to zero. Uh, Mr. Kieran. Well, uh, three or four football scores. Uh, which one, particularly? Well, most, most it important. was um, Minnesota, uh, North, uh, Notre Dame. That's right. Who won? Why, Notre Dame. Well, I have to know. <laughs> that, ladies and gentlemen, is the first question we've ever had on this program dealing with a college education. Now, the next one, uh, 100 million yen. 100 million yen can't be won. 100 million yen. 100 million. Uh, Mr. Gunther. Well, it's probably a mild estimate as to the amount of the Japanese deficit in the next budget. Uh, well, you, you have me there. You know probably know more about the budget than I do, but I think it represents a specific amount that's been in the papers recently. Uh, Mr. Levant, how do I'm you guessing. have to read the papers? All right, go ahead and guess. Well, they've reduced the length of the matches in Japan, I hear. Maybe they'll save that on that. I don't know. It's an idea. It's an idea, but I don't think that's what it refers to. I was guessing. Yeah, I got that. I got that. As a, as a guesser, you're a very good composer, Mr. Levant. No, it's the, it's the uh, capitalization of a newly formed central development company as announced in Tokyo, which is going to reconstruct the devastated area in China. Would that be right now, Mr. Gunther? I'm sure it would be. All right. That's one wrong. Now we have to get the next three right. What uh, news event does the following figure bring to mind? 10,000 soldiers. 10,000 soldiers. Mr. Gunther. Oh, the number of Italian troops withdrawn from Spain. Yes, uh, volunteers, not troops. Volunteers. Volunteers in yes, quotes. Of course. Yes, of course. Voluntary withdrawals. <laughs> 10,000 voluntary withdrawals from the Spanish war. That's quite correct. Uh, four, seventy-five thousand dollars. Seventy-five thousand dollars. I wish your eyes had stopped glistening, gentlemen. Just keep, uh, <coughs> just pay attention to the question. That's, all. That's right, Mr. Adams. The amount of money guaranteed to Donald Budd for going professional. Yeah. That's right, Mr. Adams. Mr. Adams, I <laughs> should tell you. He's among other things a professional tennis expert. I've seen him play in short. Remember that time I saw you play in short, <laughs> Adams? Oh yes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> And uh, the next one, we have to get this one right, 81. What does 81 bring to mind? 81. Don't tell me it's the square of nine. 81. It's not dollars, just 81. Just 81. Uh, Miss Mary Hill of Miami, Florida is waiting for her $10 this time. One, two, three. I'm sorry, gentlemen, that's going to cost us $10. 81 represents the increase in the number of Republicans elected to the House mm. of Representatives. You remember, over the last Congress. The new total is 170, uh, compared with 89. Now we're back on a nice two-party system again, quite out of step with the rest of the world. The next question from Mr. Jay Crawford of Houston, <laughs> Texas. Well, we've done this once before, and it was terrible. Let's see if we can keep our record up. <clears throat> I'm going to ask you gentlemen to sing in four-part harmony uh, the first lines of the chorus, or the best-known line, from each of the following well-known songs. Now, Mr. Levant, no whistling. You either sing or resign. Do you want to resign? <laughs> and I'm going to ask Mr. Milton Cross, acting as our musical authority pro tem, to judge whether this four-part harmony is really four-part harmony 
or just guessing. <coughs> the first one that you'll have to sing is Silver Threads Among the Gold. And uh, I will say three, and then you can stop. How do you know I will... Who you are? Key to be in. I have the slightest idea. Pick a key. Darling, I am a growing older. Yes, sir. Uh, how would that do? That sounds terrible. No good. Don't like that. No. Mr. Adams, pick a key. Pick a key. It's your that's, birthday. That key's all right. It's your birthday. All right. <laughs> you think the gentleman wants to try it? Darling, I am growing old. Let's keep it up. You must have been a long ago. Shine upon my brow today. They do, too. I don't know about that. How about that, Mr. Cross? Would you pass it? No, I'd never pass it. No, that's awful. Uh, two. Sweet and low. Maybe do better on sweet and low. Sweet and low. Do you want to leave it, Frank? No. Well, I'll you give that one up. Then. How about you, John? Sweet and low. Sweet That's and very nice. low. That's one part harmony. Wind, wind, wind of the western sea. Come on, get into it, Gunther. Can't get I that can't man, Gunther. Sing. Can't sing. I know, but you don't have to prove it so violently. The most, most merciful thing to do would be to ring up ten dollars yeah. quickly. <laughs> Feel like ringing up twenty-five dollars. <laughs> <laughs> I've never been so convinced of the truth of Keats's famous line. Do you mind if I introduce a line from Keats, Miss Kieran? No, sir. Thank you. Heard melodies are sweet, but those unheard are sweeter. <laughs> Thank you very much. Now, what is our loss so far? Our loss so far is $20. Now, let me see. $20, and now, Mr. Milton Cross, we're going to allow you one minute and one minute only as our Canada Drive expert. All right? All right, Mr. Fatterman. Thank you. Many of us may remember an advertisement carrying the headline, Down from Canada Came Tales of a Wonderful Beverage. This advertisement appeared about 15 years ago and announced the arrival of a new beverage, Canada Dry Ginger Ale. And soon, this remarkably fine ginger ale changed the nation's taste. Its popularity was brought about through the use of exacting precautions in purchasing fine ingredients in heretofore unheard of methods of blending and carbonation. But more important, it was a delicious, distinctive beverage that soon won the description, the champagne of ginger ales. Fifteen years ago is a long time, but nothing has altered the refreshing flavor of sparkling Canada Dry ginger ale, even though today Canada Dry is selling at by far the lowest prices in its history. Mr. Cross, that was only 51 seconds. Very good, very good indeed. And thank you very much. Now we'll go on to the next question, which comes from Mr. J.E. Manzer of Brantford, Ontario. Uh, Mr. Manzer wants you to identify the following people prominent in the recent news. You have to get four out of five. Now these names are very difficult for me to pronounce. Uh, I want to announce that Information Police is not responsible for pronunciation, and any broken accents will not be replaced by the manager. One. Ismet Inonu. Ismet Inonu. Mr. Gunther. He's the new Turkish uh, president uh, selected to succeed Kemal Ataturk. His That's name used to be Ismet Pasha. That's quite correct. Thank you very much, Mr. Gunther. Two. Wu Pei Fu. He's a Chinese warlord. I have to have a little more information that practically everybody's a Chinese warlord. Uh, not nowadays. But uh, he was uh, traditionally the boss of Shenzi province and who probably will have negotiations with the Japanese. The Japanese keep on much longer in that area. Uh, yes. What, what would his politics be? How, how would he uh, be as a... Uh, I mean, would he be for the nationalist government, Chiang Kai-shek's government? It depends on who pays him the most, I suppose. Well, I'm not sure that you're not quite correct. I have here that he's the anti-communist Chinese general, and he's to be head of the new Japanese puppet state in China, centered in Canton. I don't think that can be official yet. Well, our uh, information, please, of course, has sources of information not open to mere foreign correspondents. <laughs> I think I'm going to, uh, if you don't mind, Mr. Gunther, uh, mark you wrong on that one, because the information was not as accurate as uh, our high standard required. Though you were doing nice. Wu Pei Fu is exactly as I have explained. And he'd be a godsend of crossword puzzles. Wu Pei Fu is marvelous. <laughs> the next one. Haj Amin. El Husseini. All Great right, Mr. Gunther. Grand Mufti of Jerusalem, the leader of the Arab revolt in Palestine. That's quite correct. What is and a mufti? I know I'm right about that. You're all right. <laughs> what, what is a mufti? A mufti, theoretically, uh, is a name for a purely spiritual quality. It's the head of the local church uh, in a Muslim parish or diocese. Technically, it has no political uh, authority. I see. Thank you very much indeed. 
Now, if so I can get the next one, I beg pardon, Mr. Van. Isn't that what's weird dressed yeah, in? Yeah, we're dressed yeah. in mufti. Are you? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Not the same kind of mufti you're dressed in mufti tonight, tonight in honor of Mr. Adams' birthday. Uh, the next one, I don't think I can pronounce at all. I'll see if I can uh, sneeze it through for you. For Frantisek Chvalkovsky. Oh, he's the new Czechoslovak foreign minister. How did you know what I was talking about, Mr. Gunn? <laughs> That's quite clear. all names in that part of Central Europe have to be sneezed. That's right. <laughs> Five. And last, we only have one wrong so far. Albert de Vleyshawa. De Vleyshawa. De Vleyshawa. De Vleyshawa. Take your choice. Once more. Oh, well, I'll spell it. B-L-E-E-S-C-H-A-U-W-E-R. Vleyshawa. Sounds like Levant to me. As played by Levant, yes. Vleyshawa. You know that one? Mr. Gunther. Want me to sing it for you? Uh... I don't think that would uh, do me any good. It might possibly be one of these uh, Baltic state people who are on the fringe of these German negotiations with Poland. Nice piece of fantasy there. No, no, no. <laughs> no, is it a Dutchman? Uh, no, that would be quite wrong, though it's a nice idea. Uh, it's not correct, however. It's the Belgian minister of colonies who denied that Belgium stole the Congo from Germany and asserts that Belgium will not let anyone steal it away from her, which is fair enough warning. Well, that's two wrong out of five, and that's going to lose us $10 going to Mr. Lancer. Thank you very much. Now, the next question, next question is from a very well-known personage, Dr. Harold G. Moulton of Washington, D.C. Dr. Moulton, as many of you probably know, is president of the Brookings Institute, one of the leading research organizations of the country. The bewildering complexities of our economic life are interpreted and clarified by Dr. Moulton and his associates. Think I can get a job as an editorial writer, Mr. Adams? No. No? All right. Uh, as a matter of fact, you may probably be aware that government officials and businessmen often base their policies upon the authoritative findings of the Brookings Institute and Dr. Moulton. And therefore, you should be proud, gentlemen, that Dr. Moulton has turned to you tonight for illumination on this most perplexing problem. To wit, a name for heavyweight boxing champions <laughs> who had identical first names and middle initials. Uh, Mr. Adams first. James J. Corbett. That's one. Joseph James Tunney. Joseph James Tunney? Uh, they have to have the, the identical first name. Oh. And the middle initial. <clears throat> That's one. So James far. J. Jeffries. James J. Jeffries is two. Uh, Mr. Gunther? James J. Fitzsimmons. That's Robertson. Robert no, Fitzsimmons. that's wrong. James, I'm that's going James to J. Five, Braddock. I, I beg your pardon. James, James Braddock. Braddock is three. Yeah. We have one wrong answer so far. Now the fourth, Mr. Kieran, you really ought to know. Well, I'll begin at the beginning and come right on down. Matter of fact, uh, we've lost our ten dollars anyway. I oh, may as well uh, hint to you that Mr. Adams almost had it right. Gene Tunney, you mean? Yes. What's his name? Uh, Real name? J. James J. Tunney. James J. Tunney. J. Tunney is correct, but that's going to cost us ten dollars on account of a wrong answer I think given by Mr. Gunther. Doctor Moulton, you are going to get ten dollars to add to your financial statistics. <laughs> the uh, next question from Eleanor Lynn of Kingston, Pennsylvania. See, there are not enough of her questions on this program for Miss Lynn. She wants you to name five songs whose titles ask a question. Name five songs whose titles ask a question. Miss Kieran. Please tell me why I should cry over you. And I do mean you. <laughs> Good, Mr. Kieran. Uh, Mr. Levant. How deep is the ocean? Is that a song? Mr. Kieran ought to answer that, incidentally. How deep is the ocean? Yeah, that's by Irving Berlin. It was a big hit. I'll sing really? it for you. Six How deep is the ocean? How high is the sky? How deep is the ocean? Oh, now you can sing. Before you couldn't sing. <laughs> All right, Mr. Adams. That's two. Who is Sylvia? Who is Sylvia? It's perfectly good. That's three. Uh, Mr. Kieran. Where is my wandering boy tonight? Where is my wandering boy tonight? It's for Mr. Levant. Uh, give us a little kiss, would you? Huh? <laughs> no, definitely not, Mr. Levant. Definitely not. All right. That's Give five. It. Got another one? Yeah. Oh, that's all right. What is this thing called love? Are you asking me? Oh, that's... I see. Oh, yeah, yeah. Perfectly good. That's six. No any more? Mr. Adams? Where, oh, where are the Hebrew children? Uh, who wrote the song? That's an old song. They are safe in the promised land. That's the right. Answer. That's right. That's right. I do remember that an old hymn. Mr. Kieran, we really got to go. Where, oh, where is my little dog gone? Yes, that would do very well. Why do I love you? <laughs> you had love on your mind tonight, Mr. Levan, and stop looking at me. Uh, the next question from Miss Celia Christopher of Winthrop, Massachusetts. Here are parts of later stanzas of two well-known poems. We want you to quote the first line of the first stanza of each poem. Now, here is the later stanza. One. I'm going to read the two of them together because one man has to answer the two. One. In the world's broad field of battle, in the bivouac of life, 
Be not like dumb, driven cattle. Be a hero in the strife. Now, while you're digesting that, I'll give you the second one. Let mortal tongues awake. Let all that breathe partake. Let rocks their silence break. The sound prolong. The man who volunteers has to get the two of them. All right, Miss Kieran. The first one? The first one is Longfellow's uh, Charm of Life. And how does it go at the beginning? Well, wait a minute. I'll answer the other one. All I'm right. I'm trying to think of the yes. start of the Charm of Life. Sure. The other is, uh, the first part is My Country, Tis of Thee. That's right. Now I have to give that Charm of Life. You have to give the opening uh, Just line. give me about three words and I'll recite the whole poem. I will simply say that the uh, word dream is in uh, the first two lines. I think that's a fair enough answer. Life is not an empty dream and all that. Tell me not more for numbers. Tell me not more for numbers. Life is not uh, that's an empty dream. That's very good, Just got five of skin of your teeth. All right. But. Thank you. <laughs> well, I don't think we're going to have very much time to uh, ask another question. Information, please, announces a loss of how much? $40. Oh, it used to be 20 weeks ago, but now it's $40. Easy come, easy go. Easy come, easy go. It means nothing to you, Mr. Adams. It's his birthday. <laughs> well, we've lost $40. Lost it very willingly, haven't you, Mr. Adams? Now, before I explain... Grows on trees. Grows on trees. Before I, I still explain think how, Blue uh, Pie was wrong. Still sore about that, are you? Mm -hmm. I have to explain how you two may win $15 and who our guests will be for next week's tug of war between the public and the experts. Before I do that... Our Canada Dry expert, Mr. Cross, has a 15-second message for you. I just want to tell you about Canada Dry's sparkling water, perhaps best described as a club soda. Here is pinpoint carbonation, a champagne sparkle with a tang that is delightfully different. You'll find Canada Dry's sparkling water and ginger ale are sold wherever fine beverages are served. All right, ladies and gentlemen, thank you. Here's a list of experts for next week. The famous author, Dr. Hendrik Van Loon. The theatrical know-it-all... Mr. Russell Kraut, and our two sterling standbys, Franklin P. Adams and John Curie. And now for those who want to stump these experts and win $15, here's how it's done. You send us questions on any subject with the correct answer. You may submit from one to three original questions per letter. If your question is used, you receive $5. And if it stumps the board, $10 in addition, $15 in all. And don't get too hot and bothered if our editorial staff changes or edits your questions slightly. All questions become the property of Information Please, and letters are to be addressed to Information Please, Canada Dry, 1 Pershing Square, New York City. Remember, Information Please, Canada Dry, 1 Pershing Square, New York City, New York. We bid Mr. Fadiman good night. And until next Tuesday night at this same time, remember that Canada Dry Ginger Ale and sparkling Canada Dry Water, the perfect club soda, come in convenient sizes. The family size bottle, which is the largest, costs only 15 cents. Good night, all. This is the National Broadcasting Company. <laughs>